So, Briny, let's look over at the screen and show them your image here. So tell us, you don't have to tell us where this is. I don't want that. What I want to have is tell us exactly capturing it. What was the technique you went through to capture this? And then some information on any post-processing techniques that you went through. Okay, well, to start, um, I captured it with a 50 millimeter, which uh, was a bit stupid in retrospect. <laughs> oh, why would you um, say that? There are 48 images which make up the foreground. Oh, um, wow. Each one of them was about two and a half minutes long, so <sighs> Eric was very patient. Um, oh, man. But one of the things I wanted to capture was I'm a geologist by training, and so I love the textures in the rocks here, and then also the petroglyphs on the left-hand side. So there's petroglyphs on this wall right yep, here? That's the We're looking at the long ba barrier canyon kind of people, or what yep. is that? Yeah, yeah, they're people. Oh, cool. Yeah, so that was what I wanted to capture, and we were lucky enough to get up there just in time for the Milky Way to be perfectly aligned in the, uh, in the mouth of the cave. And these these drawings, are they similar to the one that you can find going right down the wedge when you go to that one wall? Do you Are you familiar with the area in the Wedge Canyon where you drive through and there is the big old oh. picturesque, uh, I, get, I think they're all pictographs because... Is it the wash, that They're not area? petroglyphs. Um, yes, the wash. Butler wash. Is it Butler wash? Probably. There's other names for it. I only give it the wedge because there's the Wedge Canyon overlook nearby, so I call it the... It's Buckhorn Wash. Buckhorn Wash. That's yes. the one it yep. is. I know that area. So these similar people, same uh, artists similar, from the same culture, or I do you know? I guess it's similar age. Some people have said they're fakes. Other people have said that. Well, they, people always complain if they're that they're fakes with petroglyphs. Um, but they're they're interesting just because they're painted. They're not sort of scribed onto the rock. So they're sort of you see that red sort of ochre paste, I guess. That yeah. Used. So it's a little bit different from some other petroglyphs. So in virtue, is this on the left and this high because of the wide angle? Well, that's actually 50 millimeters. So are these that high up on the wall? No. Okay, so it's just far wide panorama. It's it's a very distorted sort of perspective. Okay. Um, because the cave is so large as well. And so to get it all in sort of a frame, you really need to sort of distort the image, especially the top, the sort of the hole in the rock at the top. Now, this is the same area, Eric, that we have talked about before, right? Okay. I won't mention it, but it's an awesome close-by area. And I didn't realize the, petro the pictographs were there. Yeah, I, I didn't capture them last time I went. It, it's, like she said, it's hard. It's The cave is, like, very spherical. So the hole is, like, actually above you, not in front of you. And she goes on and creates a gigantic um, gigapano with 48 mm -hmm. images of just the cave foreground alone. Yep. How yep. many images created this back here? So it's six in the, uh, in the lower uh, portion. And then I think the top was only one or two. Okay. So how do you capture something like that, knowing that the time you spent in here is going to have a moving sky? Did you take any preparation for that? No, I mean, there weren't enough images for it to really move substantially, just because if you're only doing sort of six as a panel, uh, I just did the six as a panel and then did the top two, and it really hadn't moved in that time. Okay. Uh, you have to be sort of cognizant of how long you're taking in between shots and be, and be careful to take them consecutively. Um, and so <coughs> I spent, I think, two minutes on each uh, image using a tracking mount. Um, and then uh, making sure that there's sort of an overlap of about 25% per photo. And that's why you have six instead of sort of three. Oh, right on. When you're doing something like this, do you go capture it, the sky first, and then take all the time in the world for the foreground? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. I do the bit that stresses me out the most, which is the sky normally. <laughs> Although that's kind of changed. In Bryce Canyon, it was very much more the foreground that stressed me out. Um, but normally it's the getting the sky really stresses you out, especially when it's perfectly aligned in, in a cave entrance or just in some area that's going to frame the Milky Way. You want to make sure that you get that first of all. I was pretty keen to get Roo Fuyuki in there. Yeah. So I wanted to get uh, the details in that as well as the main uh, galactic center. And guys, don't let my image coming through the live stream make you think any of this is out of focus. This is the lower res image really magnified into and coming through you on the live stream. So this is probably crisp as ever when you're looking at it in the high res. 
capture. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Okay, so before we go on to Eric's image, I got to ask you, post-processing, is there anything special that you did to make sure that the colors of everything, foreground and mm -hmm. sky, came out the way you wanted? So, I mean, with the sky, uh, really balancing the histogram, uh, in Photoshop, that really brought out the air glow, so the greens and the reds that you see there. Um, in terms of sort of post-processing, I did a little bit of star reduction, um, and that helps you sort of draw the eye onto the galactic center. Um, and then really not much else. There's a little bit of low-level lighting in the foreground. Um, we used some very, very small sort of button-sized la lights and uh, just LEDs, and we hid them sort of within bushes. So that's why they're sort of hidden. Is it like those away. balloon lights where you pull out the tab of the yeah. battery? Okay, yeah, yeah. I have 600 of them sitting out yep. there yeah. for yeah, a video yeah. project I'm about to do. Yeah, yeah. so the tiny lights, they're, they're amazing. And it's really easy to collect them, obviously, afterwards because they're bright lights. Um, and so, you know, you're not going to litter. Um, and then we right. put a little bit of low-level lighting in the cave itself. And you can see that towards the bottom left of the frame. Is it just a single source? Yep. Oh, uh, man. Single source lit up everything up here, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. There were no? You had there were maybe like two or three of those. Little, yeah. But they're, they're but those balloon lights did yeah. what else I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Dang. It's crazy. Wow. It's so impressive what they can pull off. That's awesome. That is a fantastic image. I can see why you had no trouble deciding on that one being the one you wanted to show off first. Well, let's go to Eric's image real quick. Eric, this image... Tell us about the whole technique that came about making this happen. And that's some pretty still looking water. Right. So we had gone there the night before to shoot and we got kind of skunked, I think, because oh, of clouds, which was fine. We ended up shooting quite a bit during that trip. But this is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think this is like 15 pictures or so total. So six for the sky three for the uh, foreground and then four or five for the reflection, I think. Oh, right on. Um, and so the sky and reflection are tracked pictures. Um, the sky is, I think they're one and a half minute exposures. And then the foreground is untracked, obviously. And then the reflection is tracked. But the reflection, if you track reflections for too long, um, you still get star trailing because of water movement and stuff like that. And so I tend to crank up the ISO a little bit higher than I normally do and then track for like 45 seconds or so. So, so um, you track simply for 45 seconds sometimes. Yeah. Just for reflections. Your reflections in yeah. that case. I see. Why so short for reflections? Why? What's well, the so like I said, you know, you can, you can perfectly track for reflection, but it requires a different alignment because a reflection is an inverted the axis. Polar alignment of your track. Right. Gotcha. And so if you want to actually track the reflection, you have to polar align to the reflected axis, which is really, really difficult. Um, but I've found that it doesn't really matter anyways, because water, this looks perfectly still and like perfectly reflected, but it's still moving. The stars are elongated. And so that's just something you can't avoid with reflections. I just tell people not to worry about tracking the reflections too uh, strictly because, you know, even just basic water movement is going to stretch stars and do weird stuff, which you can see there. You know, those, yeah. those stars are still stretched. How so. close to the ground are you? Is your tripod up at eye level or do you go really low to the ground? Uh, I think? try not to keep the camera above like maybe my neck really? um, just for stability purposes. And wow. where we were shooting was from like a pretty sandy beach. And so, it, you know, I didn't want to raise it too high because then you know, if wind or something catches it, you know, it's just going to move the camera around. Um, but yeah, I mean, so like the logs and the rocks along the edge, you know, those are untracked and I didn't do a perfect job blending the tracked reflections with the untracked oh. logs. You can see how hard it, I mean, it's yeah, really, really hard. To, that's gotta be crazy hard. So this was probably the hardest picture I did last year. Cause you had the blend trees and <laughs> plus the wind that's changing the water a little bit in each image. Yeah. Next to each panel. And you can see along the horizon in the reflection, there's clouds kind like of in the middle. Here? Yep. And then they're not in the sky because by the time I 
either finish the sky and start the reflection or vice versa. I can't remember which one I did first. Uh, the clouds had moved in. We so. did the sky first, I think, because we were really lucky. We only got sort of a, it was literally uh, only yeah. about 20 minutes with really? the sky being clear. And yeah, it was, that, it was, saw lightning and it was cloudy stuff. and then like it cleared up really fast mm-hmm. and we're like, oh crap, go get the cameras <laughs> and run and set everything up and just as we had finished the sky, clouds started to come back in and I was able Man. to get the reflections at least. So Isn't that classic how you could have a sky like this that's completely corner to corner cloudless and yet it was only a 20 minute gap that you got that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so each uh, exposure I think was a minute and a half. And so, you know, you're talking maybe 10 minutes total to get all the exposures for the sky and, you know, five minutes to set up. So <laughs> you got to be quick. Man, so with the post-processing of this, you had trouble just trying to bring in the reflection and yep. bring in your foreground. Both of you had to deal with the element of my foreground is separate from my sky because you have a tracked sky. So you're having to mask anything special about this one that made this one work more for you or that you love about it or was even challenging. Well, like I think, like I said, the hardest part was really the the trees being there anytime you're dealing with trees with (laughs) tracked and untracked and blending Mm -hmm. the you know the blurry portions of the trees with the crisp untracked version of the foreground and then throw in reflections and stuff like that just getting it all to line up is i think that's probably the hardest type of imaging you can do for nightscape because it's it's it takes an incredible amount of time to post process that oh yeah I've sat there with you as you took care of some trees for three hours and you were teaching it and yeah. it's a nightmare. Yeah. You, the, you can't do it fast. You know, the faster you do it, the worse it'll look. That's and why you do so, something awesome like a rock structure like this. Yep. That exactly. doesn't have any well, needs. I mean, even, even her picture here was hard because as you track the cave entrance, Oh yeah. Um, it shrinks, right? So like you're yeah. tracking oh, you and, your lens. Yep. Uh, and so it, Oh, you're masking out parts of like edging and kind of ghosting that's happening mm-hmm. on all of these yep. lines. Yep. So it's not yeah. easy. No, no. <laughs> and you're doing it in a cave, right? So yeah. you have to like, yeah. you have to figure out how to pull our line in a cave, which. Which I didn't really oh. do. I just kind of pointed to north. Oh, we used the compass and yeah, the angle finder. Yeah. Oh, wow. I figured so, out a way to do it. <laughs> yeah, we didn't no. actually align to Polaris. Well, that's incredible how it turned out for it. I mean, you got the glory of star tracking right here of all that detail because you're able to follow, even though you just, I mean, compass, not a guess, an educated guess, lined it up without having to see Polaris. And she's doing it with a 50 millimeter lens, which, you know, really not doing a perfect polar alignment with a 50 millimeter lens. Oh, wow. I mean, doing it with like a 20 millimeter lens, not too bad, but 50 millimeter yeah, it's hard. <laughs> a couple of questions have come through for this. This one first, we had a question from Kave asking if you were using the Star Adventure on this one or the Sky Adventure. Sky Adventure, yep. All right. And then Phil over on Eric's image is wondering if you captured your panel in landscape orientation. Uh, yes. Because you, kept you were in... using the 40 lens, which yeah, is really heavy. I use the Sigma Art 40. I've been using that lens a lot, and it weighs a lot and so shooting it in portrait is very difficult to weight balance oh, but it can be done gotcha so you have to keep it you can't go in a portrait orientation typically because well of the weight. so i was using you know we are using the nikon z cameras now and so in order to use those art there's no native art uh, lenses, you know, oh. they're all F mount lenses. So you have to adapt them to the Nikons oh. and they're, it's really tricky trying to, uh, shoot things in portrait with the, okay. uh, adapter. So you got an adapter making an F mount lens go onto a Nikon Z, Z nine. What'd you say? Uh, this was the Z seven. Z seven. Yeah. So you have all that coming into play, which is why you don't typically go portrait. You'll just stay landscape. Well, just because of the lens weight and there's no good way to attach Hmm. the camera and lens to the uh, tracking mount in portrait. But I usually shoot in portrait. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Well, guys, I wanted to start off with these couple of images. For any of you, which I know none of you on here have actually not heard of these two. You guys have already loved them (laughs) from things we've talked about in the past. But I wanted to bring them up with a little bit of credibility before we talked about their new project. 
Can you guys explain for me your Utah astrophotography project? What is that, and what are you guys doing with it? Um, well, that's basically sort of... <laughs> it's not our project. She started it. I, I, I started it. Her I was, Instagram. Your Instagram name has always been Utah Astrophotography, Yeah, it right? has. Yeah, I was uh, surprised that no one else had got that name before. Uh, I know, so, me um, too. <laughs> so it's now a registered business um, in the state of Utah, obviously. Um, and so that's our business name. And we just carried it across what we do just as sort of a brand, essentially. Um, it's easier to just call ourselves Utah Astrophotography because my first name is crazy and Eric's last name is crazy. <laughs> Spill so, Brady Benedetti, yeah. Yeah, Hello. so that's yeah. So it's much easier to just go by something like Utah Astro or Utah Astrophotography. Yeah, I mean, we found we were, you know, Man, I love traveling and show. shooting from the same places. And so uh, it just, it makes it easier to share all of our work cumulatively because we are working all the time together on this stuff. So I can vouch for that. I went to the salt flats after the <laughs> whole conference. We had the night skipper conference. Then we had a week of a Milky way workshop in Escalante. And still when I went to salt flats, there were Bryony and Eric yep. up there already getting a shot. <laughs> there was even some Aurora that night that we missed yeah. out. On. Yeah. yeah. Just a tiny bit. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys have some workshops, anything you guys have that's still open that we can recommend everybody here. Uh, we have a few spots left in the post-processing workshop, which is May 20th. Um, oh, that's the cool. first night. And then we moved. We actually opened up a second um, photography workshop on the 23rd. So our workshop on the 22nd filled up pretty fast. And then there were a lot of people asking, you know, are we going to do another one? So we, we're going to do a second workshop on the 23rd. And I think there's eight spots uh, left in that one. Sweet. And they're b both the workshops this year are at Coral Pink Sand Dunes um, rather than trying to split the locations up just so everybody that does it, you know, will get kind of the same thing. Right. We do have, there's not limited space places to go, but there's still going to be tons of overlap. With the yeah. Conference. It's going to be a bigger conference this year. And I think, um, you know, we originally looked at doing it in Zion and it's very, very hard to do workshops in, in the park. Yeah. Um, let alone obey their rules that are required. Right. The exactly. <laughs> the permit is wildly expensive and they have some crazy rules. Um, and you know, we looked at some other places, but I feel like in terms of just ease of access and us teaching people, uh, the sand dunes is kind of a happy medium because it's only 35 minutes or so from Kanab. Gotcha. So well, Coral Pink Sand is the place I still haven't made it out to, so I can't wait. So guys, as we get into the Milky Way roundtable here, here's the part where we discuss methodology, talking about techniques and things that we do in our images. I represent the side of single images, and then whenever someone asks me, how do I get more color in my shot? I always tell them one thing. Uh, go longer on your shutter, so get a tracker. Go get a tracker. So when you're thinking about doing color in your sky, Bryony, I'll have you start first. What do you do, or what are your favorite techniques just to get that color? Is it as simple as saying track? Um, yes. Uh, you're obviously going to get more color from the air glow and things. You can still get a lot of color in single-shot images, um, especially if you color balance it correctly. So what would you recommend? How do you correctly color balance in a single image? So you're going to have to look at something like Photoshop or Lightroom, and you're going to have to be very careful and cognizant of your histogram. So if you take uh, the red, green, and blue channels and you line those up, you should get a better color balance. Can you uh, pull your mic around in front of you and you look over at Eric and I so it kind of passes over the front? So you're going to go look at not the white histogram, the luminosity one, but switch it to the RGB one yep. so you can see how much overlap. So you're going to want to sort of line up your RGB on the sort of left-hand side of your histogram mm. curves. And that's going to give you a much better color balance. And that's going to help bring out air glow and, uh, and the colors in the Milky Way. Okay, right on. And one of the other things you can do is to uh, to look at defringing, and that's going to help you get rid of the purples around stars and bring out, and then hopefully bring out the purples and the pinks in the Lagoon Nebula and places like that. 
And that can be a challenge where you shoot at a high ISO like I do, I blow the colors right off the row of Fuki. Those stars all kind of become a similar version of white instead of carrying the colors that they'd have if I just go long exposure, low ISO. Yeah. So with doing the single image RGB method, how much have you really pulled out? Is there anything that you know is on your portfolio that has an example of a single image or is everything there tracked? Um, I think everything on there is. Uh, on Instagram, there are a few images which aren't. I'm okay. not sure whether I'll we can... I'll pull that up. Can you explain how you do your star tracking for getting the color out? Or what do you do? Is it, is it simple as I'm saying, though? Do star tracking to get color? That's the best yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're opening the lens for longer. You're, you, you've got the shutter open. You're going to get more light coming into the camera, and that's going to give you better colors. I mean, that's, it's not sort of a, it's really basic in that sense. You don't need filters. You don't need a modified camera. You can just use a regular DSLR or mirrorless camera. So if you scroll right down. I'm scrolling down on our Instagram right now. Let me show you guys what we're doing so we can find the image together. And this is Keep a great going. feed. Is this combined now with some of Eric's images? Yeah, so yeah. we combined our Instagrams. Um, there are a few of sort of early photos that I've taken. Um, and if you scroll down, you'll see Even some further. earlier ones. Oh, there you yeah, go. so keep going uh, a little bit. Okay. Um, keep going. I mean, any of these are single shot images. These are some of the ones I remember when we interviewed you on the podcast. Yep. So, so I've seen them. That's a good one with Airglow. If you go up a little bit, this the guy right Valley. Here? Yep, so that's a single image. Oops. And, uh, and you get an immense amount of color. I mean, it's not as bright as if you were doing a tracking mount, sure. But you've still got good color in the sky. You've still got some color. You can see some pinks and oranges within the galactic core. And you can see a little bit of blue as well. Um, you should still be able to see a little bit of pink in the really nebulous regions. Um, and one of the things you can do is put up your contrast a little bit to help with that. Um, make sure that your noise reduction is not on on your camera, but that you compensate for noise when you're post-processing. Okay. In um, Lightroom, or do you use anything else that you love to go with? I use the camera raw in Photoshop and okay. then Lightroom, but I mostly do camera raw. Mm, right on. Sweet. Eric, anything about single images that you've done? Have you done a single image shot in the last, like, six years? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, God, I'm trying to think. Probably not. I mean, I think the last time I really focused on singles was maybe 2014 or 2015. Yeah. And um, cameras have changed a lot since then. Yeah. I mean, like she said, you know, the only major difference between tracking and, and single day images is tracking allows you to uh, expand the camera settings that you can use to maximize your, your camera's potential. Um, you know, you, you look at these images and they're, they're really sharp and they're really colorful. And that's just, that's a combination of everything. It's, uh, you know, us using the best settings in our camera, somewhat lower ISO, which, you know, increases dynamic range and we're exposing for an amount of time that allows us to capture color without clipping highlights. And so you, you get stars that aren't blown out quite yet. Um, you know, but you still look at, you know, some stars, we're going to, we're going to clip some stars no matter what. That's just the nature. Like Jupiter right there is insanely bright. Oh, well, yeah, Jupiter. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that's what it is. You tracking just gives you flexibility. Um, and that it comes at the cost of time and effort and having to do a little bit more post-processing. Would you guys say that the post-processing that you deal with the most is blending the foreground and the sky? Yes. Okay. I would. For sure. <laughs> she would have a smile on her face um, all the way guessing my question. She had a smile on her face thinking, yeah, that's what's happening. For me, it, I think it depends on the composition you know, like we, we talked about trees and I will spend an enormous <laughs> amount of time on that, yeah. but something like this foreground, um, mm, you know, this, in terms of blending, this took me maybe like five minutes to blend mm. nothing crazy at all. Um, what do so, you do with your foreground? Let me interrupt you right now because we're going to talk about how to get most of your foregrounds. Mm. Sometimes when you capture your foregrounds and you're trying to get as much detail in it as possible. You end up capturing this overly exposed or just too exposed to compare it so yep. close to the 
to your sky. You end up mm-hmm. having something that looks so oddly differently exposed. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do? Is it all in post or do you make sure you almost underexpose your foreground um, slightly? You can be very cognizant of things like your ISO settings. Okay. Um, so use the same and yeah. Yeah, I think. So keep them similar. When you say the same, you're saying the same sky yeah, was so 8,000 ISO. So shoot with 8,000 ISO I, on your yeah, ground. Yeah, I tend to do 1,600 or 3,200 sometimes for reflections. For your tracking, for sure. Yeah, right? but 1,600 for the foreground as well. And yeah. then just do an untracked. Yeah, I think if you are not careful with your foreground and you like... You know, if you open up your aperture all the way and then crank up your ISO and it, you know, you blow out the foreground and clip highlights and you get fringing along edges and stuff like that, then it starts looking like a crud. So really for me, it's capture as much shadow detail as you can without uh, blowing out like the horizon highlights and stuff like that. And then in post-processing, you really have to work on... um, you know, making sure the overall luminosity between the sky and the foreground is is pretty uh, natural looking. So if I may indulge an image of mine, this mm. is something that I captured the foreground at one minute intervals of 8,000 ISO. And I was so, I was so in love with how the immediate foreground here had the most brightness in it. And then the distant yeah. foreground in Moab, the Canyon lands right here, it was just fading away on its own. It had its own natural fading away. Then I had to like paint it down a little bit, yeah. brush it down to look like a more of a distant line. Crater Lake, much more close than what this horizon is to me. Mm-hmm. And now I've got a horizon that's connecting my much more close rim of, of Crater Lake and a sky that I was going to separate. And now I've got this just god awful, terrible, too bright crater lake. Mm-hmm. I had to bring it down, and it just never looked very natural. It looked photoshopped in. Yep. Mm-hmm. What did I do wrong? What do you guys think off the top of your head? Can you guess? Well, I think what happens for a lot of people is they go crazy with contrast mm-hmm. and uh, maybe some color balance. And like you said, if you take a single image and you mask the foreground and then you work on the sky separately, you you yes. have to be really careful. Um, with how you apply the contrast and color balance, because like in that foreground right there, in mine here, yeah. So I, I'm willing to bet that the foreground, the mountains, and the very far distance, I bet they were the blue back here. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, they came out very blue. Yep, absolutely. Um, that's always like super common. That's one thing I see all the time. Are, are people's foregrounds in very far distances? They turn out very blue, and then when they process the sky differently. You know, when you when you shoot the sky closer to the horizon, you're shooting through more atmosphere, right? Right. And so it tends to be redder and stuff like that. And so mm-hmm. if you're not careful with the blue mountains along the horizon and you, you got pretty good color here, you I know. I blackened them up really, probably fixing the blue because it was a bright light gray blue. Right, mm-hmm. yeah. So I ended up masking them down from my sky image to blend with down here. So what you're seeing of the silhouette is really from my sky image yep. overlapping of like an opacity, low opacity overlap with the foreground here. So I think what yeah, that turned out pretty good. I Thank mean, it, it's hard to mm-hmm. do. And if you don't notice those like those blue horizons and then you you get a lot of oranges and more red hmm. or green along the sky horizon. And it yeah. just, that contrast always makes me like, oh, that's very unnatural it's looking. It's so, looking, right? Yeah. So then the idea is to capture your foreground when you're thinking about it blending with your sky. Do you change your color balance to more warm? Do you try and make sure you just post-process it warm? Mm. What are you suggesting? I try and color balance it to the same that I would the sky. I'm not sure whether that's everybody's taste. Um, it is I, what I've been doing. Yeah. That's what I genuine generally do. Um, I think sometimes like when you can see sort of bright blue in the mountains and things, you can sort of, you can color balance it a little bit sort of warmer to be a little bit more like your sky. Um, I think a lot of people start out making everything very blue and you sort of hmm. start, yeah. you evolve to sort of warmer colors just because the sky is actually a lot warmer in color naturally or how we would perceive it if we could get that amount of light in our eyes um, to how sort of the very blues and purples that you sometimes see, which are completely inaccurate. 
Question from Patrick. He says, do you use the same aperture for the sky and foreground or do you stop <laughs> down a bit? Um, so for the sky, I gem generally use sort of either 2 or 2.8. Um, and then for the foreground, just open it right up. So as wide as it will go. This is, a, this is a good example. Like the Canyonlands overlooks, those areas deep down in the canyons are so dark. <laughs> it is like right? incredibly difficult to get uh, detail out of that without, you know, collecting a, a huge amount of 8, light. 8,000 ISO one minute. I mean, yeah, I barely got this to show up. Yeah. And so time. like in the, you know, the workshop I was teaching down there last year, I was telling people, you know, the sky, I tend to stop down, like Bryce said, the F2 or maybe 2.8, depending on the quality. You can see a crappy <laughs> <laughs> stitching artifact. Oh, right, right there. there. Oh, look, <laughs> look left. left up. You see that line? that? Oh, ran? yeah. Is yeah. that more Lightroom stitch and you just didn't clean it up? Uh, uh, it's like PT Gooey, isn't it? Yeah, I think oh, it was PT, PT Gooey before they stopped one. selling it. Yeah. Oh, they stopped selling it? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, that sucks. I know That's you really get good. a license still. You have one. You can keep yep. it. We're lucky because we have licenses <laughs> from back in the day. Yeah. But anyways, days. for like the foreground, I, I tend to open up the aperture for in dark places. Like this picture was an extraordinary dark place. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, you, if you don't open the aperture and you don't collect enough light on the foreground, you have too many shadows. If you try to do any post-processing on that, you'll just get a lot of noise. Yeah. And so... So Phil asks, have you found a sweet spot for ISO with the Z7 as far as signal to noise ratio? Yeah. 800. <laughs> 800, I think 1600. Um, so the Z7 has a what's called a dual gain sensor. Basically, the sensor has uh, two points where voltages are applied differently to the converter. Um, and so that's at base ISO, which is 64 on the Z7. And then the second gain is um, 800. And so at from 64 to, oh, I'm sorry. It's at like 640, I think, is the weird mm -hmm. second one. So mm -hmm. from 64 up to 640 is one linear range. And then from 640 up is the second linear range. And so um, the... Shooting above 640 or 800, you don't you don't gain anything. You just lose dynamic range. So you might as well just shoot at 640 or 800 and then raise exposure in post processing. Right on. And Bob asked about your coral pink sand dunes area. You guys, he's been there years ago. It's very sandy, crazy <laughs> sandy. Do you end oh. up using sand shoes in your tripod at all? I've shot in a lot of really sandy places and not used sand shoes, which uh, I now regret mostly because I have a lot of sand in my tripod. <laughs> I've, my tripod leg is gaffered right now because yeah. I broke it with sand. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a really good idea. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. <laughs> it's something that's recommended, but we've never done. It just makes it easier to set up the tripod too. Like you're not having to worry about the <laughs> tripod like falling over in sand and oh, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So. And one thing that I've always done if you're thinking about the movement of the tripod, I get it in position and I kind of jam it into the sand mm -hmm. yep. and then I let it rest. And I don't take my shot probably for like 10 minutes. Just so like it's stopped moving probably. And you have to be careful when you're walking around it too because you <sighs> can sink in the sand and then yeah create like cavities for the tripod to fall into. Uh, I've gotten cramps from standing so still because I knew that if I lifted yep. my foot up, now sand's shifting around it and it's going to be moving it. And so it can ruin it yep. for sure. So we are asking the question of bring in the most color you can. Single image. I love the idea of the RGB checking that histogram. I've never done that for, his, for Milky Way yet. I've only checked the luminosity histogram. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely going to put that to the test. Do Star it. Tracker. It's so obvious because of shutter. Now, you've mentioned ISO, some higher ISOs killing your color. Do you have any sort of recommendation for people to think, okay, you have a single image. What kind of ISO should you... No, don't give me a number because every camera is going to be a little different in your lens. I have a different ISO for my lenses even. So what do you think they're looking for to avoid? Or is it just unavoidable and don't worry about the fact that you've lost some color in the row of Fuki because you're not doing Star Tracker? I think it's kind of inevitable. If you're doing single image shots, it's going to be very, yeah. very difficult to get a lot of color in row of Yuki. You're going to get some sort of um, colors in the main sort of body of the galactic core. But I think to get those finite colors within row of Yuki is really difficult. Okay, that's what I've been thinking. What were you going to say, Eric? Uh, I 
I just think that if it's not so much about losing dynamic range, it's more about losing the window of exposure that you get with a smaller dynamic range. Um, and it depends on how dark your skies are and, you know, like you said, your lens and mm-hmm. um, your camera sensor, the, everybody's combination of circumstances is going to be slightly different. And uh, it just takes experience and trial and error. Um, you can still get color with single exposures, but it, it, like I said, the window that you have to generate an exposure and get that color is just a little bit smaller. So you tend to clip, you know, all the lack of color is just from clipping. You're just clipping your highlights and there goes your color and you can't. So you bring that. down your exposure a little bit, stop clipping and you might bring something back from it. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you, like I said, it's trial and error. You, if you're doing a single exposure, you can still take a single exposure of just the sky and a little bit of horizon that stitch those together and maybe use some settings for the sky that are uh, more conducive to maintaining highlights and, and okay. not clipping them. All right. So what would some of those techniques be? Well, like I said, uh, like in this picture here. Oh, let's look at it. I'm giving you an example of the foreground of Crater Lake so that we can talk about the foreground side of this as well. But uh, using this example for what you're saying, I have this image on a different hard drive that's in another room, so it's not showing up. That's fine. What were you going to point out? And so in this picture, you have about half of it is the foreground and about half of it is the sky, right? Okay, and yeah. you've used one combination of settings for this single exposure. Yes. Now imagine if you'd raise the camera just up to about the horizon so if the camera bottom down here was this resting sure. on that spot you're saying? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then you stop down your lens half a stop or whatever to get rid of some of the aberrations. And then you shoot at a slightly lower ISO, maybe the same exposure time, maybe a little less or a little more. You know, maybe that is enough to generate a little bit more color than the original set of um settings that you used for the whole picture. And then later on, you know, you just, you do the same thing you would for a tract. You just stitch the sky together and then either merge it, or you can try just, uh, stitching those sky exposures with the foreground, um, that you have originally. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it looks like I can't even move this image around to show you, but that is the dark sky and you can't see it well over here in this corner guys. But you can see what I'm talking about, how we have a sky captured at a nice level to get something out of the Milky Way. But then where the horizon is, is it gets darker and the changes to the oranges and greens that you're seeing, some some different air glows that are happening there. And then you get your foreground image that is roughly uh, this area, this area right here. Um, That was a pain in the butt for me to try and get this to look anything natural. Mm -hmm. Where I have in here, a distant, distant, it started fading on its own foreground at one yep. minute. At one minute here, I have a very close subject that is now really blue, really lit up. And yep. if I tried to combine that with the dark sky, it looked completely fake. Everything I did. And that's where tracking is kind of helpful because you run into <clears> that a little bit less, I think. Just because you've How got so? Because little... you are doing a long exposure of the sky. What do you guys do for sure. your foreground typically on your tracking shots? Um, I do it for around the same length of time. So yeah, come do... on this side of the mic a little bit more. Sorry. Uh, you for do sec- it for the same length of time. Yeah. So if I do two minutes tracked for the sky, I generally do two minutes tracked for the foreground. I know Eric does a little bit less on his foreground. Is it because of my image here? I went up as high as 8,000 ISO, so I brought up the background a lot. But if I stayed at 1,600, maybe 800, yeah, that would that be would have helped. two minutes of a very dimly a capture of this. Yeah, that would have helped, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. It's, it, I don't think it looks, it looks a little bit unnatural, even sort of like now where you haven't blended it just because you've got this overexposed sky <laughs> next true. to the contrasty foreground. And then you've got the sort of very close foreground, which is even darker, yeah, which sort of crazy? really messes with you a little bit. <laughs> um, and so I think the only thing you can do is darken the foreground if you've if you've done that. I mean, you can lighten the sky and darken the foreground a little bit, and that's going to help balance it. In, ni- in 2016, I took a shot of goosenecks, and I took it at 12 o'clock in the afternoon because that's how long it took to get some light on the Colorado River there. Mm-hmm. Is it the San Juan or Colorado? One of those rivers. 
I think it's San Juan or something, yeah. something else. But once the light was on there, I took the capture. And so I had to take a foreground that was daylight and darken it oh, wow. and try to blend mm -hmm. it together. And it looked okay. Hmm. I've Wrong, never done that. But yeah. it looked okay, you know, and so you can darken it. And a lot of times it'll just look like you've darkened the foreground. See, I just go for, I've done the same thing. I've, I've shot at goosenecks and I haven't got much color or much uh, light coming from the sort of the river below. But uh, I think I did a five minute exposure for the foreground. Yeah, we end up doing, uh, and you can five also, minutes. you can do blends, you know, kind of like you do for a focus stack, right? You can do exposure stacks too so you can take an insanely like here you have uh you know canyon lands you could do an insanely long exposure to get those deep deep shadows inside then, the canyon or in the distance at LaSalle. both, both. either okay. either or especially down in the deep canyon you know if you wanted data f or like you know information capture anything from there yeah do like a super long exposure for that and then do a little bit shorter exposure so you're not blowing out the horizon or anything and then maybe a little bit shorter exposure for this foreground that's very bright so it's back and to then, your landscape photography blending techniques again you're bracketing yeah, yeah essentially in your foreground at night. yeah it's like an hdr bracket and then you just you can open them as layers in photoshop and if you don't move the camera around you know they'll line up perfectly and you can mask sections into the final image and mm -hmm. yeah that, gradation I mean, we match if oh, awesome. you talk about ways to increase your signal to noise that's that's about the best you can do from like a single exposure perspective you know if you really want those shadow details you're gonna either have to do a really long exposure and blend it or um, live with noise so then the one thing you mentioned already Brianie, that you guys do for your foreground is kind of keep a similar shutter for your ground that you did for your sky is there anything else that you guys do to make sure you get the most out of your foreground I personally don't use low level lighting very much. Really? And that's something that this is a great example of a shot where we didn't use any kind of yeah, lighting. You couldn't. I mean, like no, that up. <laughs> there's, there's no way. And it would have looked weird. It would have looked really weird if we'd left some of the foreground. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's sometimes the problem. People use a lot of low level lighting or foreground lighting. And then it, it just blows out your foreground. And so you, you then get some really weird contrasty differences between the, the light areas and the dark and you've clipped it and it becomes a big problem. So with foregrounds, I've really sort of, and I continue to stop using lighting more and more and just use starlight to light the foreground and just do a longer exposure. Yeah. And this one, do you know any, have any recollection of how long exposure that guy came out as? This was, this is Eric's photo. I know he uh, shot it with an 85 millimeter. Yeah, this is, 85. A, this is an 85 nice. millimeter panorama. God, I, I can't. Like, it was like four minutes, I think. Yeah, four it's minutes. so dark out there; it's insane. Like, I was i I had taken photos with the fifty millimeter uh, when Eric was taking photos with his eighty five, and he took so much longer than I did. I was just lying on the ground, kind of <laughs> taking a nap for a while. Right, yep. took a lot longer, but that's why you get so much detail in the sky. It's incredible. In a group, there's always that one guy who's doing a panorama stack with like one minute each exposure and he's stacking eight images. You're like, oh my uh, gosh, are you done yet, dude? So yes, this is a shot. Single image, 85. 85, right, the panorama a lot to get that much in, mm -hmm. right? So Yeah, I'd say nine, expo or nine, nine sky and then at least another six or seven foreground or so. Yeah. I mean, that this picture took us, took me, probably an hour to hike out there, take the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's kind of commonplace for us now. I mean, very rarely are we, uh, shooting, you know, 10 compositions in a night and our compositions now are all, you know, we plan probably an hour or two at each composition. Do you guys do that on location or before you even leave? Are you guys that diligent that you do it before uh, you go? You have some kind of idea before you go, but I think unless you're... I know there are lots of apps that can sort of help you plan shots, but I think unless you're really there in the daytime and looking at these things, it's very difficult to know what you're going to do. We try to during the day. Like at Bryce, we mm -hmm. went during the day and found where we wanted to shoot. And, uh, yeah, we were sure to get there before the craziness of all the other people <laughs> that was wild yeah and then if you get there early you can just shoot the foreground 
Yep. Well, then take us through your methodology of foreground distractions, because I find that that is something that ruins my images faster than <laughs> balanced composition. What do you guys do? Because sometimes I get out there, I got a good Milky Way. I really love the basic subjects that are under the Milky Way. Then I go for longer exposure, and I see that I have so many distracting elements in the edges that I'm like, I, I screw it. I'm just going to go all black because it's just too distracting. What yeah. do you guys I mean, you do can, to approach you can that? make everything a silhouette if you've got those sort of right backgrounds things like monument valley that works very well to do yeah, silhouette actually it does um, look cool still and uh i mean nowadays i suppose when you go to a lot of places that's so busy with other photographers that's the main distraction and it's whether you sort of embrace that which eric has started doing a lot more or you get really mad with them which is what i tend to do <laughs> um, and shout at people to switch their lights off um, in much less polite terms. Um, but it's it's trying to work in those sort of distractions into a composition is really difficult. I mean, if you've got people who are sort of in the foreground, you can darken that. Or you could, again, you could do a blend, a sort of focus stack blend foreground to sort of highlight that. Ah, yeah. man, focus stacking the foreground with low-level lighting. I messed that up a few times. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean... There, I don't think I've ever taken a perfect shot. You know, you're always going to have something <laughs> in a picture you don't yeah. like, and that's the nature of the game. Like the picture of the cave that she took, how long did it take you to like warp the picture? Oh, so look, it crashed several computers. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, I, I mean, mean one, yeah, there's a good example if you go back to the Utah astrophotography, the main page, the or, main page of or, it. Just go back one, I think. There we go. On the right-hand on the side. Nope, stop there. Okay. That image on the right-hand side. Yeah. yeah. If you click on that, or... Yeah, it should open. Yeah, there we go. This is I Eric's... Mean, uh, no, this is Brian's. This is Brian's one. Okay, oh. sweet. Yeah. yeah. But what I... Love that. What I like about this in terms of foreground distraction is you can <sighs> see the amount of smoke on the horizon above the trees. The oh. bright blue is smoke from campfires. Oh, that's what that is. It's yeah. Camp, and it's campground. It's campground. And at the time, it really bugged me. But now I really like it. It's kind of a good element to the photo. You wonder what's going on and why does this look like I superimposed this mountain in here? Yep. But it's smoke, campfire yep. smoke up here. Yeah, absolutely. And then at this spot, there was a road that went alongside the trees. And I know Eric's photo has got some, some decent headlights in it, which actually... I think it adds helped. to the photo as well. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just have to embrace the uh, things you don't like initially. I mean, like she said, you know, cars driving by. That's <laughs> You can't control traffic. You can't, like, stop people a thousand miles away from shining their 10 million lumen lights <laughs> right. around. Like, you know, and so all you can do is take more exposures or learn how to post-process things in your picture that, you know, might be a, a problem otherwise. Like the campfire, like the smoke in this picture, it's pretty cool. You would probably spend a lot of time trying to bring it down and fix it. No, I did and nothing. You didn't have to. That's, it'd be tempting to. It, it was, I think, first of all, when I looked at it, and that's why I was annoyed. When I looked at the back of the camera, that really stood out. Yeah. But actually, in the sort of the grand scheme of the picture, it just highlights those trees really nicely. Yeah, it does. It brings them out. The silhouettes of them exist where normally they would blend into black yeah. and be yeah. nothing. So you get oh. a really nice stratified look to your foreground. And otherwise, I think the foreground would be lost in this photo. So then with the color in your sky, we probably haven't spent enough time on this because we've just given the answer long exposure. Well-tracked, well-polar aligned, you get this fireball of a Milky Way. Milky Way... Okay, let's uh, go to Aaron King's Milky Way here. It's got magenta and it's got sensor noise coloring in here that has lights and darks. Then you guys have your tracked Milky Way and my ugly wireframe of a Milky Way has become a beautiful caterpillar over here. It's fuzzy, it's light, it's <laughs> dynamic. Is there any way you can do this wrong? When, they get, when everyone here gets their first star tracker and they go out and they do it for the first time, can they get it? wrong oh yeah yeah, yeah. What do you, everybody what will get you it wrong. everyone will oh, get it wrong first yeah absolutely it took me so yeah. long i bet if if you went and looked at my first tracked pictures you'd be like oh those are horrible <laughs> and they are i mean it it's a process you learn how to 
I think the biggest thing people tend to think when they get a tracker is they can go buck wild with the editing and just like crush contrast and do all these crazy weird techniques on the sky. And, and then you dial it back. You kind of find your, you know, your style that you like and, you know, you work on not overdoing the image. Mm -hmm. People, people really think tracking mounts gives you like creative rain to go just wild. And (laughs) and you see that and people start with the craziness and then settle down a little bit and you you get better from blue and purple to sort of warmer colors. Generally. I mean, I started when I, this is one image that I actually really didn't post process that much, especially the sky. There's even very little star reduction in that. It's, uh, it's really just the image that came off the back of the camera. We were just very lucky that night. Clean, uh, clear skies and good air glow. But, uh, but I mean, you only get sort of the really nice colors from things like Cat's Paw Nebula, which is down at the bottom there. Mm-hmm. Um, those reds. I don't, I don't know Cat's Paw Nebula. Can you point it out to me? Here, I'll show you. Yeah, Eric, you guide it. It, it literally looks like a cat's paw. It's kind of oh, hard to it's see. This one here. Right yeah, here. so it's got three points to it, and then and literally looks like more? a no, looks nah, like a paw. Um, and you only I haven't seen those reds on anything but tracked photos. Yeah, you just can't pull it out. So you mentioned something there that's a good segue for my final question before I open it up to you guys on the Q and A. So you guys think about your questions that you want to pose to Bryony and Eric and get ready to write them up and write them up as soon as you think of them. Just write them up and we'll go in order. But I want to ask you guys, you said star reduction. And that is something that has baffled me ever since I learned about it from Eric when he was showing us Annie's astro actions and Carboni's actions. Mm -hmm. I tried playing around with them back then and I haven't put them into my regular workflow. I just, one, I'm Aaron King and I'm teaching it to beginners a lot and I really like sticking with, I like showing people this image and saying I did practically nothing else to it that you can't do. That's a good picture. It's still okay, right? No, it's great. Thanks. There's nothing wrong with that picture. This is the only reason why I showed this picture tonight was so that I could (sighs) get your validation. (laughs) No, but yet this is a panorama and it has a stitch of a lower foreground panorama. That's it. And it's nothing else except one minute exposures and eight second exposures on the top. There was nothing else special. Photoshop to blend them. Outside of that, I did a very basic Lightroom touch. And so I don't go into anything. And then I look at the sky and I look at your sky. The tracker brings out more stars. I'm only getting, I'm only eight seconds and I'm getting this many. Is that the main basis for star reduction? Is this, why star reduction? This image is a little bit of a bad one to show for that in some ways, just because I really didn't put any star reduction on here. The main thing is to pull out the galactic center. I suppose contrast is the wrong word, but you get a much better sort of resolution almost on the galactic center, and you sort of blend the rest of the sky so that your eye is drawn to the mm. galactic center. I'm sure Eric's got a better way of explaining. So the the easiest way to kind of make star reduction make sense is that you know if you go back to your picture you know you have a lot of stars and they look good but uh-huh. stars the stars dominate the image right mm-hmm. right they're like gems of the di- distracting blank blinks of light that and that's fun I, I think there's a million ways to skin this cat and that is perfectly okay you know for people like me i've developed a style where i shrink the stars a little bit so you can see the details in the dust lanes Mm -hmm. i mean so like sorry sorry it's on this screen you just got to pull it all the way over so how many people see zeta ofuki no one unless they track and Mm -hmm. and so if the things that make the stars small in the first place when you're tracking is you're, you're sharpening up your lens and reducing aberrations like coma and chromatic aberration. And you do that cause you can stop so the down stars the lens. Become more of a pinpoint than that right. overlapped, you know, aberration that's technically making mm-hmm. them their size. Yeah. And okay. then, and then when we're in post-processing, you know, you, there's methods, there's a lot of methods you can do to select just those stars and then bring down their size just enough not so that the sky is like totally absent of stars, but that, you know, you, you gain detail in these dust lanes and the nebula and stuff like that. So yeah. it's less reducing stars as much as it is accenting the other elements of the Milky Way. Sure. And I think that helps 
of colour as well. I mean, you ask about how to sort of make colours pop in Milky Way photos. If you reduce oh, some of Can you pull the... that bike a little bit over? Just push it, and you can lean in as much as okay, you want on the table. Okay. You just if... have to have it in front of you a little okay. bit. Sorry about that. Um, no, that's fine. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you reduce the stars a little bit, you sort of bring out those colors within the sort of nebula and within the sort of the old regions of the Milky Way, which is where you get those oranges and yellows. So mm. old stars are orange and yellow. Blue stars are young stars. So you seem to get those colors come out a little bit more with star reduction. Awesome. That Roger Clark's name came up again, as always, and he talks about star reduction. <laughs> I'll let you guys read that. I'll even pop it up on the on the screen so you guys can read Phil's comment. But uh, we'll actually have Roger Clark. I'll meet him again. I didn't meet him last uh, I Nightscapers. Did. Uh, I was <laughs> on my one break that I got during it, and I I did not realize he was even speaking. Or yeah, I went and had dinner with him. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah, right on. Good. Is he is he nicer in person? He's a very different person. That's good. In person um, away from the whole <laughs> debate of well, night photography. <laughs> he's gonna be ha he's gonna get some time to teach actually in this coming Nightscaper conference. So I'll get a chance to learn more from him. So then, what other actions do you guys take advantage of? I know that Eric was using Annie's and Carboni's a lot. Do you use another? I, I literally only use the star selection action in well, Carboni. That's it, star I, selection. I yeah. don't know about this action. <laughs> I'm not sure. Really? His action, yeah, uh, I've uh, never uh, used them. Um, I haven't used any actions yet. I learned about them from Eric, so I guess it makes sense. That I I mean, maybe I need to as well. Sh <laughs> she touched on this a little bit ago. Uh, I think one thing that people have a misconception about these images is that we, we do a ton of post-processing on them. But in reality... And this, I always get this, like when I do the post-processing lessons that I teach people, it, it's maybe like a dozen steps. Yeah, it's and, not even uh, that. And they're like, that's yeah. it? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> tracking affords you the ability to like really bring out detail and stuff like that with minimal amounts of processing. You don't have to go crazy and you, you get great results. Um, that's really good news. Yeah, it's so like people will spend more time on blending and stuff like that, but you can you can just extract more quality and information out of just a, a tracked image. But the time you you have to invest in actually taking the pictures is much more. I've heard you once describe it as you now with star tracking, you go to a space and you kind of get one image out of the night sometimes just because you spent the whole time setting up for that one image. Well, I don't even think it's just, now our setup time is five minutes or less. Nice. Um, but you, we shoot at long focal lengths. You know, she shoots at fifty a lot, mm -hmm. and I shoot at forty or fifty. Um, and and so when you do these big panoramas and you're doing tracked skies and track foreground and lining things up, it just it takes longer. Um, but we, I think we're okay with doing one or two really really good shots a night, knowing that mm -hmm. they're going to turn out great. Versus like running around and just trying a bunch, <laughs> bunch of different compositions. Yeah. Uh, when we go to Devil's Garden and Escalante Workshop, we're out for like 12, 14 different compositions. So we know what that opposite feels like. So then while the Q&A has not blasted up with a bunch of questions, I'm going to ask one. You guys both shoot more telephoto. What's your favorite lens right now for those? Mine is the Sony 55 millimeter. Sony 55? On a Zeiss. Uh, on a Nikon, sorry. Uh, so seriously, 50 millimeters, not quite enough, but extra five is worth it? Or is it just that lens is so that great? That lens is really, really great. Okay. Really so it's the 1.4 um, f-stop 55 Sony lens. And then I've adapted it to go on the Nikon Z, Z7. We, oh, man. We think it performs yeah. better on the it's Nikon better, than it yeah. does on the Sony. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a Sony lens. On the really? <laughs> Nikon yep. camera. That's incredible. So, yeah. Um, is it getting a benefit from the adapting? Any I don't sort know. Of like I'm faster sure. or so help in the cut. I don't know. I know the um, the sensor stack. So the glass that sits on top of the sensor is a little bit thicker. I think on the Nikon versus the Sony, and I think that's the difference. Oh, okay. So it's it's helped as well. I mean, there's a 24 millimeter that's an f 1.4, which was I really disliked it using it on the Sony, <laughs> and now uh, taking it to the Nikon Z7 again and adapting it works great. 
uh, I talked during buying that lens and yeah. she hated it for like <laughs> six months. It was expensive. That was too. a really expensive lens. I really yeah. hated it for a long time. <laughs> and now you love it. No, I, yeah, I'm, I, I wouldn't say I love it like the 55, but I'm, I'm okay using it. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Is yours the same, Eric, or do you have another lens? Uh, I, my favorite lens is the Sigma Art 40. Sigma I, Art 40. Yeah, the 40 millimeter. I don't think there's a better lens currently available. You can you can shoot that lens at f one point four with at least my copy has zero chromatic aberration zero Ooh. coma and is like absurdly sharp like stars out of that lens are just tiny little dots. So if so. I'm looking for investing in a Sigma lens for my next one, I should start at the forty. Start and then be done. Well, I mean the the, the twenty eight is also very good. I used that lens in Iceland and it was pretty good, um, but different strokes for different folks. I mean, you might yeah. find that the 40 is just too narrow for your liking. I'm but, heavy. Oh yeah. Oh, it's you'll extremely you'll heavy. get a workout <laughs> with the star tracking 40. gear now. And I'm going to bring a big old brick of a lens. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's getting fun. I mean, that lens I think adapted to the Z seven is like almost three pounds. Yeah. Oh my God. Just, it's insane. It's huge. It's like the size of my water bottle. <laughs> Uh, Daryl asks, so double adapter, is it E oh. to F or F to Z? It is Sony E mount to Z. So mm -hmm. it's just a single adapter. It's actually very thin. Um, you know, the, the, the adapter thickness is like maybe that it's mm, tiny Okay, and that's great. You can, I mean, you can pretty much put any lens on the Z mount. Uh, you can adapt almost any lens to it. I've adapted some crazy weird lenses. That's for sure. <laughs> Right on. So you guys have not hit us up with too many questions, so maybe we'll just let Eric and Bryony go soon before you guys have any more. With the discussion of making our foreground strong and bringing the color out the most, is there anything that you guys haven't said that I interrupted that you were about to bring up about that? Um, I think we both agree that we're kind of over... Uh, foreground lighting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, low level lighting and foreground lighting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Bryce, I don't want to be harsh, but Bryce Canyon was a bit of a joke. What were people lighting up? Because the only thing I've ever lit up in Bryce is Fairyland Point. It and was, that's even a stretch because it's hard to light up everything I'll, well. I'll post the time lapse that I did. And you're going to be like, how did you even get any pictures from that? Because yeah. it, it was are literally just nonstop, like people shining lights everywhere. And light like, painting with headlamps and crazy bright lights. Kinds of things. And, oh, yeah, okay, I gotcha. And so we actually met up with uh, one of the rangers that night. He was shooting out. Um, in the park and he came down and talked with us a while. And, you know, there's the debate about arches and Canyon lands and these other places mm -hmm. banning foreground lighting. Mm -hmm. And, and he said he's, he wouldn't be surprised if Bryce enforces that in the near future. Um, yeah. I just think there are, there's too many different kinds of shooting and too many people at most places. And so the only logical solution is just not use any lighting at all because you, you can't satisfy everybody. Yeah. And, and it's hard to stop everybody. I mean, that's right. the thing that drives me nuts is that has it changed and fixed the problem The people walk around there with their headlamps on, they can't stop them from having headlamps. Right. On. And you know, we try to be cognizant of that, but I think the, the main problem is, you know, people bringing crazy flashlights out yeah. to places and just shining it's, it's them. It's light painting. Yeah. It's, it's uh, painful. And you have to work with people and communication is important. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I don't, I think people are under the assumption that you need foreground lighting to get really great pictures. And, you know, maybe for the majority of compositions, I, I would argue you don't need any lighting at all. Mm -hmm. I think it just depends on what you're shooting. If you're capturing a very intimate shot of like, oh, it's yeah. a bridge, you know, oh. that land, land bridge, uh, that's mm. something that's great when you get it to show up instead of being just a silhouette. But then you can make it look really unnatural. Uh, so I you think have to be careful. You've got to just be really, really careful. And when you're tracking and when you're doing, yeah, that, I mean. Is that too unnatural or do you, to what do you feel about that? Uh, to me, I think, it bugs me on the right-hand side of the picture that you've got much lighter areas. Uh, this over here. Yeah. Um, I probably would have darkened that a bit maybe. Um, sure. I just think that you probably, with a longer exposure, would have pulled out a lot of that detail anyway. I it's, mean, yeah, like she said, I think 
if you do a good matched long exposure with any kind of exposure of the sky, the the lighting even evenness for lack of a better term is just, it, it appears more natural to me when you do it that way versus using lighting. But I, for me personally, the, the issue isn't so much like, can you make a natural image or does it look great? It's just that yeah. the, okay. f- the vast majority of people aren't going to do it right. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that's the problem. It's like you either ban it. So no one really knows the right way, in my opinion, or you allow a version of it where it's constantly being taught and like eventually you get everyone on board, but it's going to be impossible. Yeah. Those same people, though, that you worry about never getting on board, or my argument is, is that they're still going to do it without realizing that the parks uh, have actually banned it. And it just comes back to education. Yeah. Communication and education. Yeah. Teaching people that you can get great pictures without any lighting. And then also, you know, educating people, hey, everybody has different uh strokes and you know if Mm -hmm. if somebody's out like imagine if you were there that night and you set up these lights and you spent all this time getting this picture and then some guy walks in with like one of those freaking truck led lights yeah and just blows it out and you're like well yeah that would suck i'd have to talk to him and be like give me a few more minutes yeah absolutely so you know just educating and communicating Mm -hmm. you, you can't do anything else and it's something that we're gonna have to battle with all the parks like you said bryce is like at first it was the tetons now it's also all of the arches and canyonlands area maybe soon bryce zion has weird rules right now with yeah. tripods even yeah and uh, <laughs> i looked at getting the permit to teach him bryce and it was like a thousand dollars for the permit no way i did not know the price has gone up to a thousand dollars it was a little for the workshops we were teaching the size it was wow. i think it was like nine hundred dollars for the permit and the, and you had to you had to teach like outreach things in the park mm-hmm. during the day yeah. and you can't take workshops more than like a 50 feet or 100 feet off the road Wait, what? yeah what about walking down into the okay you yeah. can't go down to wall street or oh is this, was zion. Tr- this was zion. oh it's zion. not price not price <laughs> yeah zion's a thousand dollars yeah it was something like okay that. my gads well we'll get Anyways, off of that and go to yeah. stanley's question that's asking you guys what location would you like to shoot that you have Ooh. not been to yet can we can we say a location that we want to go back to? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So well, okay. so I used to live in Namibia, and uh, and at the time I didn't have any money for a camera really at all, um, and I worked all the time. Um, so we're actually going back to Namibia this August, and oh, we're gonna going to go back. back to the areas where I lived and visited and to take photos. So August Milky Way will be a very vertical, but how's it in Namibia? It's cl- it's not at the equator, but is it? It'll be an arch. It'll be yeah. an arch still. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. it'll be the Southern Milky Way. So, in August, it's a Southern arch because it goes throughout to the morning, huh? Because it basically yeah. starts yep. vertical and then you see it flatten out. Yeah, an arch oh. over there. Yeah, so, so it starts vertical like this, and then it comes back around and forms that nice arch. Yeah, that so you there see. are there are a few places in Namibia that we're looking forward to shooting. Um, some areas in the desert and uh, and also some around the safari parks. I didn't realize the movie was that far south enough to be just like New Zealand's Milky Way or Australia's oh, yeah. Milky Way. It, okay, the movie is pretty far south. I'm picturing the yeah. wrong. I'm picturing the wrong place then in my mind. So Southwest Africa, over right next to South Africa. If you go up, okay, yeah, like Mozambique area. Yeah, no, to the west. To the west. Mm-hmm. Okay. Either way, that's actually a far better Milky Way than I was realizing it was going to be. And you guys are going to be there and capturing it over what? Are you going to go to the dunes? So someone just asked about dead fly. Um, oh, yep, exactly. Seuss's, Seuss's fly has become a little bit too touristy. Um, mm. So I think we're going to... When I lived there about <laughs> six years ago, it was no one went there. It was a local's place. And I think now it's kind of been overshot. So we'll be going to places like the Caprivi, which is the very thin strip of land that you get to the east of Namibia. Mm. And so we'll be shooting in some of the wetlands there and hopefully not getting malaria. Um, With any luck. With any luck. (laughs) Um, And then also um, just doing some photography on the way out. There are a lot of mountains. There's a lot of wild lands. Um, Dead fly is beautiful. Seuss fly is beautiful. But it's just been it's been overdone. Okay, it is really expensive to stay in that area too, really? unless no. you camp. It oh used my. to be super cheap six uh, years ago. I, I looked at just 
just you six know years camps ago. and lodges yeah. and stuff down six around six years ago Sousa it Fly was and, uh, you could get a five star hotel for less than a hundred dollars you think it'll yo-yo you think it'll go up and then go oh, back we've, down we've Depends. had this debate uh, <laughs> i i don't know oh, no. Sousa Fly. i think namibia is so keen to get their tourism booming mm. that it's good for them yeah i mean great. it's a pretty poor country so we're, we're wondering we've talked about night photography you've seen this like exponential interest yeah and we have this back and forth about whether or not it's going to plateau and come back down or if it's just going to keep on this crazy trajectory because i mean like i shot in bryce two years ago and i was pretty much the only person there right and we were there two weeks ago and there were eight cars in the parking lot and we had probably 10 other photographers what section were you in not just the main you know sunset sunset? point Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. It's already so, changed. Yeah. It, it's curious to see, it'll, I'm curious to see how Namibia is and you know, if it's become, how are we going to be able to popular. follow you guys out there doing that? You're going to share a bunch of pictures. Uh, You're going to do we'll YouTube be on, videos this time. We'll be on Instagram a lot with stories okay. and things. Yep. Instagram's our main sort of reach out. I think we'll probably do some, some videos and put those on YouTube as well. Cool, just because. I hope so. It's it's a great place. It's uh, <laughs> it's very unique, especially the north of the country, which is very poor. And don't share any locations. Don't make them popular yet until I get a chance to get out there. Yeah, yeah you know, I'm in Namibia. It's it's a case of safety as well. I think if you've lived out there, great you know point. where you're going to be safe, um, even from things like bull elephant and crocodiles and mountain and lion. So yikes! So I'm I'm very careful to tell people where not to go specifically just because of those areas. Sounds like we're all going to have to hire you guys as workshop leaders in order to do mm. that in the future someday. So Utah <laughs> Astrophotography guys, check out at Utah Astrophotography on Instagram to follow them there. We have a couple questions here that are going into the technical stuff again. So uh, uh, Philip asked, walk us through the process of capturing a multi-row sky panel track. Wow, that's an intense question, Philip. Sequence of moving the camera, etc. Can you do that sure. without any gear? Um, I think it's very dependent on your composition and the time of year you're shooting. So, you know, this, we were in Bryce and we got out there early enough that we could do the foreground first and get the foreground done. And then when you do the foreground, I personally like to just snake up and down left and right, um, Mm. either left and then down and then right, or do the snake interesting method. i've never snaked like that i've always gone all the way over and then all the way over yeah i think it, it Why just not? well so like in bryce where i was set up i was up against what's called the mask and so it was, it was closer to me than to her and so i had to change my focus to get the mask and gotcha. focus and so i just snaked right so i didn't have to go left change, change the your focus, focus makes sense focus and then come back okay so You know, that kind of experience, um, you just develop over time for that kind of stuff. But for the sky, we always go back and forth. The sky is dependent on how you want to align things. So for us, we, I tend to start north to south to give the core time to rise up a little bit higher. Okay. Whereas if you start south to north, you know, the core is lower. But again, that can change. If you want to catch the core over like an arch or something like you had here, you know, if you started left and north, maybe by the time you get to the core, the core is almost behind it's the rock. It's touching the rock or underneath. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so uh, your order of operations depends on if you're butt against like sunrise or sunset. You know, if you find that you're shooting up against sunrise, you'll want to get your sky done before it's too light. Or vice versa, if you're like shooting up against sunset, you know, you can wait a little bit longer maybe and and catch the core when it's truly dark. Um, And then the rise of the Milky Way versus whatever your foreground element is, you, that just comes with, I don't want to be that guy, but it it comes with experience, you know. (laughs) The guy that says it comes with experience? (laughs) So, um, yeah, I, I think you, you use apps like we use. I use Planet Pro to kind of get a rough estimate Kirk is of. Love you for saying that because Planet is his favorite. I like Photo Pills. Or Photo Pills, amazing. Yeah, Planet has a tons more features. It's just more in depth. There's just a lot of. Teach. I mean, five years ago, none of this existed. Yeah, it was literally uh, us going out and being like, "Well, this 
could work here. We have to wait until it's dark and I can see, you know, <laughs> uh, did a lot of compass measuring. Yeah. It was, it was a lot of trying to work out. Walk. Yeah. Be. I would now literally so lazy. It's great. I would literally walk around with a compass and be like, okay, is this tree, where do I need to stand? So this tree isn't blocking wow. South or whatever. And, Wow, that's yeah. way different than I've experienced. So use apps to define the timing, you know, so you can plan when you get to your composition and choose whether you want to do the foreground first or second, and then decide whether you want the core to rise into a position or if you want to start with a core and move away from it. Um, okay. just, just like in your picture here, you know, in this picture, you would probably want to start with the core first because it's so frame, you know, it's framed so the nicely. The timing of the core being there is important versus where right. the left. I mean, if the if you had started on the left and each exposure is two minutes and it takes five, you know, exposures to get oh, to the yeah. core, ten minutes later the core could be blocked. So, um, yeah, I think, and you know, we we fight clouds all the time, and you might only have like a. 15 minute break in the clouds to take your picture. So if you're working on the foreground and you see those clouds are going to break, just stop your foreground, take your sky and then you can go take back. that foreground anytime you want. As long as, yeah, as long as the lights eat, it's not like sunrise. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it starts breaking it. So. so next question from Alan Houdina is what is the most common error made by beginners when using a tracker? I'm going to say polar alignment. Um, I think people are very, and I do this all the time. I panic about polar alignment, getting it absolutely perfect. <laughs> and uh, and I don't think you need to unless you've got something like an 85 millimeter. I agree mm. 100%. Um, we shoot 40 to 50 or 60 millimeters in that range. I, I don't, I haven't looked through the polar scope, polar uh, scope, you know, at that focal length in a long time. I literally just take a laser pointer hold it up to the polar scope and put it on Polaris and that's and it. And once you've lined it up on Polaris, you're good to go. That's that's the last time you check because it's mean, just a wide angle. You don't care. Yep. It just doesn't ever miss. I mean, you get up, like she said, to 85 millimeters, 135 millimeters, then you got to be a little bit, you, you, okay. know, you use your app to figure out where Polaris needs to be. But I think a lot of beginners freak out about polar alignment <laughs> and they're like, this has to be dead on. No, you don't. Like, you guys showed a perfect example of just using your compass, knowing where north was. You lined it up, and then boom, you went and captured your shot yeah. inside the cave, yeah. and it turned out great. Yeah, I I think the funniest example I have of screwing up polar alignment was like when I first started doing tracker stuff. I didn't realize the polar scope is um, mirrored. The axes are mirrored. And so I put Polaris in the exact opposite spot of where it needed to be. Oh. And I was shooting with an 85 millimeter lens and I was just screwing around. I took a 15 minute exposure with it, like improperly polar aligned and it turned out perfectly fine. So I was like, yeah. it's like Mary Beth agrees with you. She's been doing a lot of star tracking the whole last year. And she said, I've been using, I found that with wide angle lenses, I can literally plop it generally facing north and it's been fine. Yeah. yeah if, if you're using like a 14 millimeter lens, oh, yeah. you could like, ballpark it and be just perfectly fine. <laughs> You'll have more problems with rotation distortion than you will from polar alignment error at those oh, wow, yeah. super wide length angle My gosh. shots. Well, it looks like we hit the last of the questions that were coming up. We've been talking now <laughs> for over an hour, almost an hour and a half. You guys have been fantastic guests to have on here with us. You guys have your last question possible. You have your chance right now over the next 30 seconds while we're closing up. But uh, thank you so much to Bryony Richards. Thank you for Eric Benedetti. Thank you guys at Utah, Utah Astrophotography. Follow them and you have some. If you're going to the Nightscaper Conference, and I know that many of you are, what is the one workshops that are open again that are still available for you? Uh, we have the post-processing workshop, the 20th, and there's a couple spots there. And then we have the Coral Pink Sand Dunes workshop on the 23rd, and there's eight spots. Eight there. spots available still. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, sweet. Uh, one last question from Mary Beth. Have you ever... Oh, sorry, that's not Mary Beth. That is Terry. Have you ever used the Move, Shoot, Move tracker? Um, no, but I have read a lot of reviews on it, and Alan Dyer did... I was just going to say right, Alan's. He did a fantastic review. Um, it's a good mount if you don't ever intend on moving past, like, maybe 35 millimeters in focal length. 
it has some very strange gearing uh, actuation that has to like occur before it really tracks well. So oh. a lot of people find that when you use them out and set it up and start tracking, you have to let it track for like a few minutes before you can even take a picture because there's some, I just, I, there's a lot of tracking mounts out there and the move, shoot, move is a very cheap and very small one and you get what you pay for. And I think, uh, if you're okay with dealing with those issues and not going crazy with your focal lengths, it's probably okay. But why not just buy the star adventure mini or something for like another 50 bucks? It honestly is not so expensive that you need to find an option otherwise. Yeah. I, you know, our star adventure, the regular star adventure, you can probably buy that used for like two fifty now oh, or yeah. something. Even There's... on Amazon, you can just buy it used <laughs> on Amazon. Oh yes. I mean, if you're, if you're like a backpacker and you're counting grams, maybe the move, shoot, move makes sense for super portability, but otherwise I just don't think it's worth it. Last question. Then I'll read everyone's thank yous. And Bob asked, do you ever track the full moon? You ever done it? Um, with a big telescope. Yeah. But... We'll show Derek Schultz moon while we're doing that. <laughs> you ever track the full moon, but with a big telescope, yes, nothing with the lens. I, I personally don't really take moon photos that often. I don't, um, I don't think difficult. you need to track it. Yeah, it's <laughs> I mean, kind of, it's, it's you so can right. handhold the lens and <laughs> I've done that. You just handhold the lens. And yeah. Take it. It's so bright. If you're taking it's photos. It's too bright. And, exactly. Like so. with a long lens, you're talking like, one two thousandth of a second exposure before it's blown out. You don't even, yeah, you can, I guess maybe like a lunar eclipse. Yeah, sure. It'd probably help the blood with. moon eclipse. I've yeah. done some, well, basic tracking on that. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Even that's pretty bright. Awesome. Oh. You guys have been fantastic.